Some of you might be wondering what exactly is integrated HSGC workflow? Haven't they always been integrated together? And so in this webinar, we'll explain that and also cover how integrated communication can improve analysis performance and how it brings efficiencies in the lab that save on both time and cost and how we've made improvements to our pressure balance sampling in the headspace that improves both sustainability and performance. And then we'll save a few minutes at the end, like we mentioned, um, for a question and answer period. So if you haven't heard the buzzwords lab of the future, take note and not only will you hear them today, but you'll start to notice and hear them more industry-wide as it's becoming a common term in the scientific community. And when we're talking about the lab of the future, we're talking about a new way of analysis that is sustained by digitalization, connectivity, and automation. Um, these are just examples of continuous improvement of technology to help laboratories become more efficient. So last year, uh, Perkin Elmer launched the GC2400 platform, and there are several small things that we added that maybe at first glance, they don't seem all that meaningful, but as we go through this webinar, you'll see how all of these small things add up to big efficiencies. For example, with the latest and greatest electronics in our instruments, the handshaking communication going back and forth between the HS and GC during analysis, this allows the PPCs, gas flow, and timings all to work together as a single instrument. And we're calling this integrated communication. This integration is also in our instruments where now the instruments have a SOM and their own um, IP address. Essentially, it's an internal computer. This allows connection to our instruments with any device within your network that has the right permissions, which means you can have continuous monitoring and even get notifications. So speaking of notifications, it's hard to see in this picture here, but each instrument has LED strips with coordinated colors and even in some cases sounds that can alert users of system and sequence status, um, which you could see even from across the lab. And one of the most important outcomes of this integrated communication is how we achieve sustainability. And we'll talk about that in detail in this presentation. So the lab of the, the, lab of the future approach we've taken with the GC2400 platform can provide optimized performance, sustainability, and cost savings and as we talk about these benefits, we'll use method USP467 as a perfect example. And with that, I'll turn the time over to Miles, our, one of our senior application scientists, to go into the USP467 method. So take it away, Miles. Thank you, Tiffany. Do appreciate that. Um, essentially, what we want to do is talk about the analysis of these residual solvents very specifically USP467. As many of us know, the active drug component and the excipients used within the manufacturing process can contain, and in some cases do contain, residual compounds. These volatile organic compounds are needed to, for the processing and the making of the drug. Unfortunately, some of those are toxic. So therefore we need a way if, to monitor those and USP467 is a very good way to do that. We're also gonna talk about USP467's uh, need, especially with the FDA and, and other organi government organizations for compliance needs to support 21 CFR part 11 to ensure the safety and quality. And on the next slide, I'd like to talk a little bit more about the method itself. I'm sure that some of you already know this, but I'd like to just describe it briefly so those not familiar with USP467 can understand. First of all, I'm gonna look at class three. Class three compounds are low toxicity and the requirements say that we need to identify those, but only quantify if, if the limit of detection is around 0.5%. That's approximately 500 uh, ppm. With that said, there are compounds in there like ethanol and ethyl acetate that aren't very toxic at all. The middle class is moderately toxic, so therefore the limits on those ones range between 50 and 3,000 ppm. 
we need also need to identify those and quantify only if above the limit. So it's not more than, and we'll talk about that in just a few moments. There are a number of compounds that are highly toxic, benzene, carbon tet, and other chlorinated compounds. And we need to not only identify those, but we need to quantitate those down into the two to 10 ppm level. In this particular example, we're gonna be looking at very specifically P, uh, procedure A, and that is a, this limit test that I just mentioned, and it's gonna be using a G43 uh, column. In the real world, if that fails, you need to go then to, to run your sample on procedure B, which is a different column, a G16, and then if both of those fail, go on to procedure C. The next slide, we're gonna look at some of the challenges. Very specifically, class one has a very critical signal and noise requirement between on carbon tetrachloride. Carbon tet really doesn't have any hydrogen, so it has a very low response on an FID. In that particular case, we're gonna be looking at that very specifically. Class 2A has a minimum resolution between two critical components, methylene chloride and acetonitrile. Now the labs expect a repeatable result, of course, but it needs to be highly accurate. And also all this needs to be covered under 21 CFR part 11. Next, we're gonna look at the chromatographic conditions. Now we're not gonna go through all these particular um, parameters, these are well-defined in the USP467 monograph. I'd just like to make, spike out a few items. The column I'm gonna be using is an elite 624 column, 0.32 millimeter ID. Uh, the rest of that is pretty straightforward. The other thing I'd like to spike out for a discussion in some upcoming slides is the column pressure program there on the left. In this particular case, we're gonna go from 13 PSI we're gonna hold it for 20 minutes and then we're gonna do some uh, ramping of the pressure. And uh, that will make a little more sense uh, in an upcoming slide, as I mentioned. This is for class one and class two. Class three, you, uh, you can actually change the parameters as you wish. On the next slide, we're gonna go and dive into class one. So in this one, we have only five compounds we're looking at. And I'd like just to show you uh, two chromatograms. Both are on the GC2400. One is using the Perkinomer Simplicity Chrome CDS on the, uh, the right-hand side. And also what we've done is collected the same uh, information, but on a different CDS, and that's the waters and power. Now, in the slide set here, if it's, um, a white background, like the one on the right-hand side, that will be a simplicity chrome chromatogram. If it has a gray background, like the one on the left, that will be in power. Now with that, we can look at the table on the bottom and some of the things you want to spike out is let's look at benzene. The NLT or not, uh, not more than three, or sorry, my apologies, this is signal noise, so it's not less than uh, three we'll see benzene is significantly higher than that, approximately 70 times. So it really, with benzene and some of the other chlorinated, the uh, detection is not an issue at all. Now you will see a, a significantly diminished response for the carbon tetrachloride, which if you look on the right-hand side, it's around nine minutes there. We actually, the spec is not less than three, and we get consistent values in, in the team. So 14 uh, signal to one signal noise ratio. Fantastic, very easy to integrate. You can get good accurate results uh, with that type of signal to noise ratio. Next, we're gonna look at class two. Class 2A, as we discussed earlier, has a critical resolution. And if you can see that in the uh, second set of of um, analytes in the top chromatogram, they're around four minutes. So we're gonna expand that out and have a look. So the first two peaks is that critical resolution. 
it needs to be one. And we have calculated a value of 1.4 for the resolution here. So very easy to have chromatographic separation, very easy for uh, integration and quantitation. And this goes to show that the column is working correctly, but also that the system has minimal dead volumes and so on and so forth that could lead to broadening. Next slide. Um, this is class 2B. It doesn't have any particular system suitability requirements. So the good news about that is it's relatively straightforward to do. And as you can see, very good separations between the target analytes. Next, we're going to look at class three. And class three, once again, we have a little bit of flexibility as far as the chromatographic conditions. Lots of compounds there. Uh, as long as the, their concentrations are less than uh, 5,000 ppm. On the next slide, we're going to now switch topics and look at lab efficiencies. We're going to look at time savings, remote monitoring, and looking at the software integration. On the next slide, we're going to look, we actually the original method, as you see on the bottom there, is a very long analysis, over 60 minutes. And really what's going on, it's really the first 10 minutes or so is where the real important stuff is going on. And you can see that cluster in between eight to 11 minutes is where our, our compounds of interest are. We also have one there a little earlier uh, at 3.6. So the thought is, is that um, if your laboratory is running lots of these types of samples, you really want to try to minimize the, uh, the run time. And as such, then you can run more and more samples every day. Now, essentially what I did here, the concept was, let's just reduce everything what's going on after the peaks of interest. So, you know, our separation will be the same at the 40 degree at least the thermal, but we're going to clean up the column much quicker. And in this particular case, we're increasing the ramp significantly, and we're leaving the final temperature the same. And we're also going to leave the column at the upper range a little shorter as well. Now, uh, it significantly reduces the amount of time to run the sample, and we get about a 67% reduction in the run time, which leads to a 160% uh, increase in sample throughput. Now, of course, one of the things that we may be concerned with is the uh, signal noise ratio. How does that affect our carbon tetrachloride? So, in the FAST method and the original, are about the same as you can see in around 12, 13, 14. And on the next slide, I'd like to pass that over to Tiffany. Thanks, Miles. Um, so in the introduction, I talked briefly about digitalization. And one of the new things in our 2400 platform is that each system has a SOM with its own IP address, like I mentioned previously. And this is gonna allow you to remotely log in um, from your CDS, even in power from any computer within your network with permissions. This will allow you to stay updated with your analysis wherever you are. Um, but in addition to that, we also have a web application we call Simplicity Vision. It runs on the tablet of the GC system, or really this web app would run on any PC or device within your network. And from that single tablet, you could actually log into multiple 2400 systems. The, both the GC and the HS are integrated in a single workflow within the software. And the tablet can operate either wired or even wireless whatever your organization and IT department will allow. So Simplicity Vision gives you access to the instrument status, readiness, 
sequence status, et cetera. So imagine yourself in a meeting and then receiving a notification from the tablet that your analysis is complete or being able to take status information to a colleague and discussing which instruments are gonna be available at what times for certain analysis. It allows you to manage your laboratory and time more efficiently having that information wherever you are. So in the previous slide, I mentioned our web application, Simplicity Vision, that runs on the GC tablet interface. And you'll see a screenshot of Simplicity Vision on the right, where both our HS and GC are integrated together as one workflow. And on the left is a screenshot of Perkin Elmer Simplicity Chrome CDFs software. I realize if you sign up for this webinar because you run USP 467, the odds are most of you will use Waters Empower and all the data we've shown previously was using Empower. But I also wanted to show you real quickly um, the new Perkin Elmer CDS. It's so incredibly easy to use. Um, you'll see it looks very similar to the web application. And our new users have even commented that if you know how to run a GC, you already know how to use this CDS. It's very user friendly. And at first glance, it might look like there are a lot of fields, but we avoided the use of drop down menus. So everything is just right in front of you and very easy to find. Um, but for those of you that do use Waters Empower, I just wanted to show um, that we have an Empowers driver that allows very smooth integration of your GC2400 platform into Empower. And you have the same control as you would with our own CDS. So here's a screenshot of the method control, sequence building, and audit trails as you would expect. And here's just an example of an Empower report from when we ran the USP 467 class one standards. So we're gonna shift gears just a little bit and talk about sustainability. It's an important topic on everyone's mind. And we know that one of the biggest challenges for gas chromatography labs are, um, is basically the consumption of helium. With the GC2400 platform, and when I say platform, I'm including both the GC and the HS together. We have new PPCs on all the models where there's information constantly being sent between the GC and HS back and forth throughout the analytical run, um, including things like actual temperature measurements, pressures, and flows. Um, but before jumping into the 2400 platform, let's just back up for just a minute and talk about how GCs and, and HS work historically. So typically these two systems work independently, to, um, independently and then their timings are coordinated. So for example, if let's think if you have a constant flow set on your GC, um, I've, I've kind of put this in a graph on the right. So the constant GC flow is at the bottom in a blue line of the graph. As the GC oven increases in temperature, then the pressure in the GC will increase as shown in orange. Now, the headspace pressure must always be a little bit higher than the GC pressure to keep the sample flowing from headspace to GC. So historically, as a user, you'd have to calculate the highest expected GC pressure and then set your headspace pressure a little higher than that for the entirety of the run. And you see this headspace pressure um, setting um, in the yellow line at the top. So what can happen at the beginning of an analytical run is that there would be an excess helium flow coming from the headspace and it's just wasted out of the split vent of the injector. Now today with the GC2400 communication between the HS and GC, the HS can respond to the GC's pressure increase in an ideal way to save carrier gas. You can see this on the right represented by the green line showing the headspace pressure following the GC pressure and avoiding that large amount of gas being vented out of the split, especially at the beginning of the run. Not only is this ideal from a sustainability perspective, 
but this is also much easier for the user because previously, if you were gonna set this type of ramp with the headspace, you would have to calculate all of that um, yourself. But today these calculations are done automatically and the user doesn't have to figure it out on their own. So here in this um, brief example, we've shown exactly how the handshaking communication between the headspace and the GC can save you carrier gas. Um, also using the same example where we constantly maintain a higher pressure in the headspace than the GC, remember the two lines in the graph, um, you can also avoid sample dilution during injection from the headspace into the GC from the GC carrier gas by having that headspace set at a higher pressure. And another interesting thing that can happen, let's say by mistake, you set the headspace pressure set point too low. Um, with the 2400 system, the GC pneumatics will make up for that missing gas from the headspace. So in the past, if you've had or used our turbo matrix headspace, you'll know that previously we didn't have carrier flow control on the headspace. And that is an improvement we've made today on the HS2400, as well as what we've shown in this example of auto calculating headspace pressure to stay above the GC pressure. So again, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and onto our next topic of having confidence in your data which is extremely important for those of you in the pharma industry. Um, not only do you have to have um, good performance of the instrumentation, you know, like having good repeatability, but you also have to have compliance to 21 CFR part 11. So in talking about performance with our new Headspace 2400, we're typically seeing 0.55% area RSD and 0.0026% retention time RSD when analyzing 0.4% ethanol. Uh, this is mostly achieved um, in due to our pressure balance sampling technology. Um, you can see what that looks like with the rendering on the right. But basically with pressure balance sampling, the transfer line or the GC column is inserted directly into the headspace needle. And so in the graphic, that column or transfer line is represented with that yellow line. This allows us to completely avoid using a valve and sample loop. Yes, this technique is acceptable by USP 467. You don't have to do um, any, any proof of a validation or anything. It's just accepted. And our entire GC platform will accept will support your lab compliance to 21 CFR part 11. So I just wanted to show you um, an example of what that repeatability looks like um, due to having exact pressurization of every vial, again, low dead volumes in the system because we don't have a valve and loop, and then due to the precision pneumatics, especially with the new PPCs in this system. Because the sample volume is driven by pressurization and sampling time, you can set your volume simply as a parameter in the method. So you can, you can change that um, from, from different methods just within a setting. And this could allow your lab to grow as your needs might change over time. And also without the valve and loop, there are fewer parts in the headspace to maintain. So just to summarize what we've talked about in this webinar, um, and we've, we've integrated some of the concepts of the lab of the future into the Headspace and GC2400 systems. Um, in order to deliver advantages and efficiencies to the methods you're already running day in and day out, like USP467, these features can deliver faster analysis supported by an easy to learn CDS and remote monitoring. Sustainable lab operations can be achieved with our integrated communication, doing things like lowering your gas consumption. And lastly, you can have confidence in your data with features like pressure balance sampling in the headspace and the pneumatics in, in both of the instruments. 
And with that, I'll say thank you so much for your time and attention. And if you'd like to investigate our GC platform further, please visit the website shown here. 